everybody. Welcome to another 80s golden age of comedy. Really excited to have on my guest today. He's somebody I've known since the uh, the 80s, obviously. He was a, a major part of the comedy scene. Family, major part of the entertainment industry. So I'm really thrilled to have on my guest, Will Schreiner. Will, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Bruce. Good to see you again. I hope that thrill passes quickly. <laughs> you know, I love that Carson curtain behind you. That's one of the... You like that? Yeah, you can see the Carson logo there. Oh, I used it, I, I I used it in a that's... picture I had. It just, you know, for anybody who grew up in that era of com 80s comedy, this was the pinnacle. This was where you tried to get. You wanted to be the guy that came out of that curtain, did a six-minute set, and Johnny said, come here, come here, sit down. And that was, you know, that was really a goal of all of us. And and I'd say, I mean, for me, I started grow, grow up watching Ed Sullivan and Carson in the 60s and 70s. And, you know, and yeah. then when I moved to L.A. and got into doing stand up, I mean, that was the role. I've seen you had Tommy Dreesen and other people on, you know, that was where we wanted to go. in, in those days, you go on a Carson show. I remember my first Carson show. Uh, I got booked the next that weekend to open for Paul Anka at the Aladdin. I mean, it was like you, that. So you too. Wow. Because that's what Tommy said. He said he went on, did that show when there weren't 10,000 comedians on then. And, oh, he he really put it beautifully, that whole setup about how much pressure and how he was ready. And the next day, his phone was ringing off the hook. And he said he hasn't stopped working since. Oh, yeah. Well, that's true. I mean, I, I, I'm sure... Well, we've all stopped working because of COVID, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I've worked, you know, you know, I was a little bit more diverse in a sense that besides stand up, I also wanted to be a producer and a writer and a director and other things. So I, I've always, you know, found a way to make, make a living well, and, and that living was in comedy in one way or another. But yeah, that standing behind that curtain behind me with your, you know, and you hear the band, bah, 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 boom, and you hear the stud of the band stops and then you hear this muttering. Uh, my next guest is making his comedy debut and your heart just goes boom, ba -boom, ba -da -boom. <laughs> and Jim McCauley would stand next to you, give you a sip of water, the curtain open. You walk out into this blinding sea of white lights because they had big spotlights up high. They had a really 500 seat raked audience. And, and when you get that first laugh and you watch any comic, then there's clips, you know, all the time of comics, that first big laugh just pours down on you and you just kind of breathe it in and go, Oh, this is going to be fun. And that's what happens. You know, you, you have a great set and then you come back and you got to do it again and again and again. You know, I, I did about, I don't know, about 14 appearances on The Tonight Show. And everyone was as important as the last one. As a matter of fact, I was doing a Carson podcast. Uh, the, the Johnny Carson's Foundation had approached me to, to interview people that had been on the show. And I remember Bobby Kelton, who'd been on like 40 times. Jeez. And, uh, you know, we all talked about that for, I mean, everybody remembers that first experience. Kevin Nealon was on recently and we talked about, you know, that first experience, it was nothing like it. Uh, you know, if, you know, it was like a goal, I think for so many of us. And then now you reach that goal and now you have to find a new goal. You have to find something else you wanted to do for a lot of guys. They wanted to get their own sitcom when, you know, I guess it was, you know, Jimmy Walker and some of the early guys with sitcoms, and then along came Tim Allen and Seinfeld and everybody, and then everybody wanted to get a sitcom because that's, that's big money. And it's, you know, it's big recognition and everything else. And, you know, the challenge is, you know, to get, to get to that level, there are not many, there's, you know, a handful, I mean, Ellen DeGeneres did it, you know, and, and, you know, you go down the list of Roseanne, who was a huge, you know, sitcom star, you know, that's, that's, that was what we worked for, you know, as our second goal. Cause I mean, I remember Roseanne's first shot on the tonight show. She just killed. I mean, there are a few people that just their first time out of the gate, Roseanne, Drew Carey, Ellen just had huge sets and got called over on their first visit, you know, first time out and Johnny brought them over. And what, what I learned as you go along, you know, I, I was told, don't, Hey, don't even look over there. You're not going over. We're running long. <laughs> so, you know, you take your bow and you, and you wait and you come back and do it again. And then eventually I got to, you know, get called over and sit on the panel and to make Johnny laugh. I have a couple of clips on my website where J Johnny's like pounding his head on the desk because wow. a joke, he, he got a beat late. And, uh, and then uh, towards the end of my career, well, not towards the end of my, of my Tonight Show visits, I got to where I could just walk out on the curtain on the side and sit down. 
And I thought, well, that's pretty cool to do. And then somebody said, you know, the reason that Seinfeld, Cosby and Carlin and Rodney, they all do stand up because they want to remind the audience that they are comedians. See, at that point in my life, I was an actor. I'd just done this movie, Peggy Sue Got Married for Francis Coppola with sure. Kevin Turner and sure. Jim Carrey and Nick Cage. So, you know, now I'm an actor. I'm, you know, done, I did that in Amazing Stories. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm an actor now. Who needs, you know, who needs to do stand up? But I still, I, I've always done stand up, still do, love doing it. I do it, you know, now in, in much smaller groups. <laughs> well, as, you know, you know that uh, we saw you uh, in uh, at the Black Box in Boca Raton. Uh, Earlier in the year, you and Bobby Slayton. What a great show oh, that right. was. was. Yeah, that was Bob. Was it Bobby Slayton or Bobby Collins? Bobby Slayton. Oh, Slayton. Okay, yeah, because I was I go up there with Bobby Collins a lot when he's in town, and I, I love whenever Slayton's here. I usually go work open for him. It's funny, my old old friends. You know, they'd rather have a guy like me open for him than some younger, you know, comic who may be a little more, you know, crude in his material and everything else. So I opened for Louis Anderson, for Saget, you know, for uh, Kevin Nealon, you know, any of those guys that come down. Because for me, it's still fun to go out, especially in a theater. If you're in a, you know, 800 to 1,000 seat theater, the audience is facing your direction. They're not drinking. They're not talking. They're there to be entertained. And it's, you know, it's as good as it gets. And the last few times that I've done that, and now it's been a year, practically. It'll be a year in March since that last show I did up at the Black Box. Mm. But he's back doing shows there. Yeah. Yeah, I saw he's doing he's doing the Ed Sullivan like an Ed Sullivan review. That kind of looked interesting. Yeah, he's got a, he's trying to do anything. He has two he has another venue up in Palm Beach or up up in uh, maybe it's in Vero Stewart rather. And he's just trying to, you know, book he's got, you know, Michael Winslow, he's got Sarge. He's got, you know, anybody that, you know, put, you know, what it boils down to in comedy, I mean, as, as, as this is probably mostly, com I'm talking to mostly comics, is if you put asses in the seat or not. Do you put asses in the seats? Do you draw? Then you're going to make a, a lot of money. I went to see uh, Sebastian Maniscalco out at uh, a hockey arena. I mean, Sebastian is as hot as he gets right, or it was when I saw him. Him and Gaffigan, those guys are selling out, you know, 10,000 seat arenas. You know, that's wow. that's a huge accomplishment in their career. You know, when Dice got to Madison, I think Dice was the first guy to really play, first comic of our Whoa. generation to play Mad Madison Square Garden. <laughs> and he played like two, <laughs> it was huge. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So it, what's amazing is, uh, Will, that in the 80s, you were very much not just a comedian, but you were with these guys, friends with everybody, got along with everybody, everybody, all those people, Roseanne and all those people you just mentioned, they were all at the comedy store and the, uh, and the improv. Well, it was a different time in the, in those, in the seventies and early eighties where everybody supported each other. I mean, if, if you were on the tonight show, your buddies all came and sat in the audience, you know, and applauded and, you know, and, and you know, it was a very much, you know, the Bud Friedman at the improv would, would you'd come into the bar and, and at 1205, you know, they turn, you know, they turn up the TV and watch your set and everybody would pat you on the back and all that. It was very much a, a collaborative and a supportive and a, and, a, and, a, and a, you know, and an environment where, you know, we rooted for each other, you know, comedy got a little darker in the nineties because everybody was like, hey, well, 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 where, well, it's more, where's my turn? You know what, you know, they, they felt entitled to their own, uh you know their own shot and 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 i think there was jealousy in some parts i remember what i mean i i i had a talk show a syndicated talk show with westinghouse we did 200 hours and it was on at different day parts it started off up against a show in new york called uh, regis and we thought well yeah. what is that you know but regis killed us and they moved us from 9 a.m in new york on the nbc station to after letterman at night and we did we got we got like a, a, another million people watching the show because in New York, everybody gets off work and they had nothing, and there was nothing on new or fresh. So I, I my head, that show became very popular in New York uh, in that period. And it was on in Chicago late. And then it was on in LA in prime time and different places. It's funny. It played at different places, but as I had the show, then suddenly all my comedian friends wanted to get on, you know, mm -hmm. now they're mad at you. Hey, how come I, I'm not on your show? And I'd say, well, you know, I'm not the booker. You know, I have a booker. Oh, it's your show. You can put me on if you want to. And we had a guy, Dick Carey, who booked the Tonight Show and booked a lot of shows. And we had a comedian on almost every show. But, you know, sooner or later, you know, you walk in the improv and people are mad at you. you know, oh. I'm sorry, man. So tell me what it was like when, you know, 
almost from, uh, you know, being young and maybe high school, how did you get from being someone in high school, someone in junior high school to thinking to yourself, you wanted to be in show business? Uh, you know, I went to, I went to about, uh, I think about 11 different schools growing up. Cause my dad, we moved around a lot. We lived in New York city. Then we lived in New York in upstate in Larchmont area. Then we moved to Florida. Then we moved to LA. Then we moved back to Florida. So going to like, I think I was, I counted it once. It was like nine or 10 different schools through, you know, from elementary through high school and a sense of humor got you, you know, from getting beat up, you uh. know, if you had a sense of humor, people like to, if you could make people laugh, they weren't, you know, they weren't threatened by you. So I think that's where I first learned, you know, that comedy could be helpful. I mean, I remember going watching my dad work and thinking, this is the best job in the world. He, he goes on from eight to eight 45 and it's over. He just wants to work 45 minutes a night. So, uh, but in Catholic school, if I could make my friends laugh and then let, get the nuns to smack them, that was another great. Oh, that was so the, I, that I think was I was the best, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Mister Mister. Hey, I, Mr. Schreider said something. I know, hey, you know, but you know, so I, you know, I was attracted to a sense of humor. I think I always had a sense of humor. I think people innately have either have or don't have a sense of humor, or, or what what they recognize as comedy, or, or you know, we call them laugh ears. You know, guys that, that I got, I, I, I got to laugh. I got to laugh. You know, no, it didn't. I'm sitting in the back of the room. I ain't gonna laugh, but they hear it anyway. I was uh, doing a uh, uh, an appearance at Disney at Disney World down here. They have the MGM Studios, and they had a uh, they have this program where you're a star for the week. So you put your hands in concrete every day. You do an interview. You go around. It's just because there was nothing going on, so they wanted. Disney wanted to look like there was something going on. So they'd fly you down, your whole family, put you up in big suites at whatever hotel you wanted to stay at. And I would do a joke in my act. My wife was with me at the time and she was pregnant with my daughter. And my son was about three, maybe four, three or four. And uh, the, um, the girl would interview and say, oh, you know, tell us about yourself and welcome to the Disney. And we're going to induct you into the Disney family of stars. And I, so this is my son. This is my wife, Kathy, and my son, Nick. And uh, Nick, what does mommy have in her tummy? He goes, oh, baby sister. And I said, what do you have in your tummy? And he goes, oh, teddy bear. And I said, oh, what does daddy have in his tummy? He goes, gas. <laughs> and he would get a big laugh every day. He got a big, I mean, it's like 5,000 people out there. And one day, not much of a laugh, you know? And, kind of, and he looks at me and he's like three or four, think about this. And he goes, bad crowd, <laughs> bad crowd. <laughs> so, and I knew he had an ear to hear the laughter and recognize that and then he became a comedian about i don't know five years ago when, well maybe more well, he was down here and he would go to shows with me and i said yeah write some material and get on so now he has you know he has a 30 minute act and he can go on he goes on he does a lot of open mic still but he, he's been on at the comedy store and the improv and he's been on at the black box with me he's been on and you know he's got a great stage presence he's got a you know confidence and that's those are two sort of crucial elements and then you know material comes you know nobody has material when they first start you start building material I mean I had like I I began showing funny little movies I had these documentaries like like little newsreels and stuff I showed at the comedy store in the improv in 77 77 and they would kill but I had nothing around them I mean I was you know and I got immediately got on at the comedy store regular and Bud put me on as a regular at the improv and then, you know, I met David at the comedy store. And of course, he took me on to his morning show. And, you know, from there on out, I had some, you know, TVQ. So, it, you know, it was easier. So before we go too much further into the 80s, and I don't want to leave uh, without having you tell me a little bit more about your dad, because there's nothing like understanding comedy, understanding the entertainment industry, even way back when. Well, he was he was a humorist, which is a little bit different. He was likened to Will Rogers or um, uh, Ken Hubbard, and he was from Indiana. His most of his act was about being from a small town in Indiana and kind of being, you know, kind of a rural guy. You know, he he, he entertained in the in the in the army. He was on, in the special services during World War II, and he went all over Germany and entertained. and And he was in those, you know, it was pre USO, but it, he got used to doing shows. So, you know, when he, when he developed his show, he had a, a 15 minute show with arrow shirts in the fifties. Then he had a, a two for the money, which was a game show. It was kind of like Groucho's you bet your life where two people would come out and he would interview them 
and he'd give them a carton of old gold cigarettes was, was why nobody ever saw the show again. Cause they stopped allowing cigarettes to be advertised on television. And then he had a variety show uh, at the end that was on, and he had, you know, Jackie Gleason, Orson Welles, he had all Red Skelton, he had all, wow. he had a bunch of big Ooh. names on it. And, and it was on a network, I think it was on ABC uh, for, I don't maybe only 13 episodes and then they canceled it. And it just, my dad was like, yeah, you know, maybe, he kind of got soured on television and then went out and worked live. So he would go all over the country with a pops orchestra. And he'd play the music and he'd tell his stories. And so he had his own sort of evening show, you know, a, 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 and he'd play in all these open air venues that are out there around the country. And I was, uh, I think I was about 14, 13 at the time. And we had a gibbon ape, if you know what a gibbon is. It's a primate, big, long arms. And it's a, and, and so my, my dad had got this gibbon when he was like two, three weeks old. And so he... Um, he would take me along to wrangle the monkey and my job was to bring the monkey on stage when he called for him, you know, cause he's, he would talk about, you know, kids talking back. And I finally found a kid that doesn't talk back. And, you know, and so I, I'd be in the wings holding the monkey's hand and, you know, we'd be looking at my dad, be getting laughs and, you know, we're in some beautiful, you know, venue somewhere. And I remember looking at the monkey and both of us were thinking, Hey, we should get in show business. <laughs> we are in show business. So I would bring the monkey out and, 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 uh, and my dad would get a few laughs with him and, and then, you know, I'd take him away. And so I, I was exposed to, you know, what it's like to be in the wings of a, a show where people were laughter. Laughter's a, a, a very, uh, I'm sure you've heard from a lot of comedians, laughter's this, this, this the, to be bathed in laughter is, is a very unique experience. And it just feels good. It, it's, you know, it, it, it raises me up personally. I mean, to just to, if I go out and I have a, you know, 30, if I'm open for somebody, I do 25, 30 minutes. I mean, I come off and wanting more, I want more, you know? Uh, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever lost that desire to get out and, and be in front of people and make them laugh. Well, you know, obviously you haven't lost a step. You haven't lost a skill because you, you and uh, you were great and opening up for uh, Bobby Slayton last year. Uh, I'll throw some pictures in of us that we took uh, after the show it was really great. Before we leave your family, you said you had a twin brother. Tell me a little bit about that growing up with him. Well, I, I have a twin brother and he's an actor. He's been on General Hospital for 44 years. He plays a character called Scotty Baldwin. And I always make fun of him. 45 years. You know what that shows, doesn't it? It shows no range uh, <laughs> playing the same character. But he's, you know, he's he's made a great living doing it over the years. He's, you know, he loves his fans. He loves being Scotty from General Hospital. Uh, as we grew, we grew up, we shared a room where, you know, most of our childhood and, you know, uh, he, he, he and I are like night and day for being eight minutes apart. We're like night and day in terms of personality and everything else. But he, he has a good sense of humor. I put him on a show. I had, I had my son on and I had Woody Woodbury and I had my brother on a show at the Black Box. And my brother has no act really, you know, he steals my jokes, you know, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I always say, you know, he's eight minutes older than I am. He's they're the happiest eight minutes of his life. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, growing up, we had each other so, as we changed schools and ran around. And when we finally got to Fort Lauderdale, we lived down on the water. We lived on the river down here and we went to school by boat every day. We, we would go and we had a little 14 foot boat, take us 20 minutes to ride the boat up to school, but we couldn't drive a car. We couldn't, you know, so we had a boat and we'd go to school by boat and then we'd come out after class in our gym shorts and water ski home from school every day. Oh. So that was a pretty cool way to grow up. Wow. And you know, I'm back in Fort Lauderdale, not far from where I lived as a kid, because I like it here. I mean, I love the water. I love, you know, we've got, I'm a scuba diver. I'm a pilot. I got, you know, I got all my vices. I'm a golfer. All my vices are within, you know, 10 minutes of here. So it's kind of nice. I mean, and I kind of burn out on LA. My son is, you know, as, he's a third generation comedian. There's not a lot of third generation comedians. I know that you know, Albert Brooks's dad was a comic. And I, I know Dana Carvey's got a couple of sons that are doing it. And, you know, you try to pass on, you know, stuff to them. And, and uh, I said, but you got a unique deal. He's now doing voiceovers and ADR work. And he's, he does animation. He's working on a movie right now, a big Warner Brothers movie. And he's, you know, he, he'll call me up. He's hey, dad, I just got a check for 50 grand. And I said, wow, well, I didn't show business. Great. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. So he, um, yeah, he's doing well. And, uh, you know, my brother, God bless him. He's still in LA hanging in there. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't miss LA, you know, too much. I miss my kids. My, my daughter lives in uh, Orange County 
And uh, she had no interest in show business. So, you know, if you pass that on to your kid, my parents discouraged us. My, my brother wanted to be an actor from the get-go. My mother was a, a, a vaudevillian dancer. She was an acrobatic dancer. Wow. So they knew how hard show business was. So they, incur- they discouraged us. Oh, I don't get in show business. They, and, you know, so I tried the opposite tack with my son. I said, oh, yeah, get in there. You can't spend all the money you make. And he, you know, he came full, full bore right into it. So, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it is what it is. You, you want your kids to, uh, you know, do something that makes them happy. And I, I, when I speak to comics or I speak to anybody in, in, in entertainment, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta like what you're doing or it's not, it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be work. I go to the Carson school and, and gave a lecture and, and did a whole thing about, you know, I, I do a teach, uh, I, I have a little, little dog and pony show about directing movies and directing television and i show them how the rehearsal works and all this stuff and everybody you know like wants you know everybody wants to get into the arts because it's it was a it was a great place to be it's a little different now in this you know in this environment but uh, it'll come back yeah after talking to a lot of the guys you know they're really suffering now because you know they don't have the cruise ships (laughs) You know, they can't even work the old age, you know, the retirement homes. It's just a no, there's no, yeah, but there's nowhere to go. I mean, the, the, you know, the crew, I live, you know, like two minutes from a cruise port, Port Everglades, and we have 12 ships a week, uh, a day on Saturday, 12 different ships on Sunday that come in and out of here. And they, you know, every ship's got a show on it. Everybody wants to laugh. They, you know, the old days when I used to work ships, you'd come on as a headliner and you do your one night on the ship and you do two, two separate shows. You do, a dinner show, which was like at six o'clock. And then you do like a late show, like at eight 30 or nine. And the audience would be, you know, sound asleep when you came out because they just, you know, they, they just eaten a big meal. It was <laughs> it, but it was, you got to see the world. I mean, I've been, I've been to the Philippines. I've been to uh, Hong Kong. I've been to Australia. Wow. I mean, it's a great, it's a great gig. A lot of, I got a lot of friends that get on and off ships or have a place here because this was their basis. And ship comedy changed because they put these smaller rooms in. So you have these ships that have 5,000 passengers and you have a room that seats maybe 200 people. So you have to do like six, eight shows a night. It's grueling. But I mean, it's, it's, it's a great training ground if you want to be a comic uh, and you want to get better at it because you, you're doing so many shows. So, you know, if you've got, you know, say, say most of them do about six shows a night, six times 200, it's 1,200 people. So they got to do all five nights to get that audience all in there. And a lot of, you know, people will come back uh so you know it's it, it's different i know some people that do the the retirement things elaine boozler was telling me she was working the lakes a lot you know the lakes is up in orlando and it's you know it's a very sort of upscale retirement very active everybody's got harleys and golf carts and you know it's it's a very active senior lifestyle up there so those guys um you know they have shows they want to be entertained they got money they got a desire so you know comedy will always you know find an audience i think until now. Now, I would not want to be some comic that relies solely on on uh, doing stand-up this year. It's because, I mean, some guys just had, their income was just cut to zero. Terrible. Uh, Terrible. And know. so are, are there any cruise ships going out at all that uh, no, take not, on not that? Yet. They're all sitting anchored off the Bahamas, just sitting, at, you know, dead, dead anchor with, you know, a minimal crew on them. So they're going to come back, they say, in June. I have some friends that work for Royal Caribbean. They say they think June, when the vaccine is commonly used and you can prove that you've been vaccinated, that they may, you know, come back around. But, you know, cruise ships had norovirus. You know, they've had viruses way before COVID. I mean, yeah. they, you know, they, these ships would come in here and, and drop off 4,000 sick people right in my yeah. neighborhood. It was, <laughs> yeah, but... It'll, it'll, it'll be, it'll be better. You know, I mean, one thing I realized as I got older in comedy, I remember once my uh, manager uh, said, Hey, there's a breakdown. They're looking for a Will Schreiner type for the show. And I said, Oh, well, you should submit me, you know, I'm perfect. And he said, well, they want a younger, cheaper Will Schreiner. Oh, oh okay. Now, I, I get it now. This was like, this was like 1994, five, oh, six, somewhere. God. Like so I decided, you know, boy, I better figure out something else to do. And, uh, I, I met, uh, I've known Kelsey Grammer, who's from down here. He's from Fort Lauderdale. Oh, I didn't know uh, I went to a, yeah, I went to a TV Academy thing with Jimmy Burroughs and Jay Sandrich were being honored at the TV Academy. And I bumped into Kelsey and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I was, you know, I'm thinking about directing television. You know, I've been directing, I directed a ton of stuff for Letterman in the early days and been doing funny little films. I, I think my bloopers that I did films. And so Kelsey was kind enough to say, if you want to learn how to direct TV, come to Frasier and hang out 
call my office wow. tomorrow, come and hang out and watch everybody work. So I was like a, a sponge. I went, I went almost for a year, you know, all the time and watched all the different great directors that came through there. Andy Ackerman, who did Seinfeld and Pam Fryman, who did many, many shows. And, and, and I, they were very, Jimmy Burroughs, all these people were very open about the process. If I had a question, why, why is the camera over there? You know, they kind of nurtured me a little bit. And then one day, uh, Peter Casey, who runs Frasier, who was one of the creators of the show, and David Angel, Peter Casey, and David Lee were the three guys. And Peter said, hey, I assume you want to direct one of these one day. I said, yeah, no, I just come around just to see what you're wearing. But yeah, that'd be great. And uh, he said, okay, we're giving you one. And they gave wow. me one. And it was it was a great episode about racism and Kelsey with uh, Kim Coles was in it. And it just was a great episode. It won a Humanitas Award for the writing. And uh, from there, I just did, and then I did a one with Betty White and then I did, got to go over to Raymond and then I just kept expanding. Then I went to Becker, Wife and Kids, Norm MacDonald had a show at the time, Bob Saget had a show and, and I just kept, you know, adding and doing more shows. So you do three the first year, you do six the second year, you do 12 the third year. And by the end of the season, I was doing 17 shows and a pilot. I did a pilot with Debbie Reynolds for the WB. So I was kind of off and running. I mean, I really uh, enjoyed it. And then uh, uh, I got uh, uh, Jimmy Buffett, who was a friend of mine. We were talking and he had this book that he optioned called Hoot, written by Carl Hyacin, who's a great Florida writer. And Jimmy thought that I would be a good guy to, to get the Florida. It was the old, old Florida. So I read the book and I said, yeah, let's, he said, how do we make it? I said, well, we, we get a script we like, and, and then we go out and sell the script because nobody bought the book. So I wrote, the, I said, I'll write the script if I can direct the movie. So I wrote the script, got notes from Carl. Then I got notes from Jimmy. Then he gave it to Frank Marshall and Kennedy Marshall's a big producing. Ken, oh, Frank yeah. Marshall's a huge producer. Oh, yeah. Sixth Sense. He did all the Jurassic's and all stuff. So he gave me notes <clears throat> and I thought, you know, he's right. And I made another adjustment. And we took it in our first meeting, we took it to Walden, which was a company making books into kids' books into movies. They did the Narnia series and they did holes and they did a bunch of, you know, books, young adult books into movies. And they bought it on the first meeting and we were off making, and then we came down here to make it and, and we shot here. And my wife at the time was like, Florida's great. And I said, yeah. So we sold our house and we came to Florida and we kind of stayed down here. I mean, I still go back and forth, but uh, making a feature film uh, for New Line. It came out on 3,000 screens. It had problems in the, in the uh, big release because it was up against the Da Vinci Code, uh, Mission Impossible 3, oh, and the Poseidon Adventure. So, oh, you know, here's a little kid's movie about saving the owls. So the box office, you know, although we were a top 10 movie for the first two weeks, it wasn't a movie that set the world on fire, sadly. And it's, but it's been running ever since. It's a matter of fact, it's in the Smithsonian collection for environmental movies. It's in the MoMA in New York for family films. Wow. So, it, and it has, it has this amazing cast. Brie Larson, who went on to win an Oscar, a BAFTA, a SAG award for, for Room. She's the star, one of the leads. And Brie was Captain Marvel. And she's in the Nissan commercials now you see her. So she's a huge star, has a big following. Logan Lerman, who's in Hunters and who was in Percy Jackson and, and 310 to Yuma. He was the other lead kid in the movie. So I'm, I'm attempting to get it back out there because it's 15 years since it came out. And now we have a whole new generation of kids who've never seen it. So I'm trying to convince uh, Warner Brothers who owns it, you know, let's put it on your, everybody's streaming everything, HBO Max and stuff like that. We'll put it on there. Maybe you'll find a new audience, you know. So I'd love to see it. So you can't really see it on uh, Prime or anything. Oh, yeah, you can see it. It's on Apple TV. It's on Apple TV. It's on Amazon. It's you oh. know, it's it's all over the place. <laughs> it stars Luke Wilson and my, uh, <clears throat> my uh, Jimmy Buffett's in it. Um, a bunch of great actors are in it, and uh, it, it's it's been available. You know, it was actually up on YouTube for a while. You can see it for free on YouTube, which aggravated me. <laughs> but they eventually made them take it down. You know, and uh, you know that that to me was a big, you know, sort of a big accomplishment, making a movie and then walking that carpet. We, it premiered at the, uh, what's the fa farmer's market in the, gro the Grove. Wow. And, you know, we could walk the red carpet and we had the cat. It was a big, you know, it was a big release. It was on 3000 screens all around the country. Oh, great. Um, it never, the most kids movies don't really travel. They don't go international because the, the, the foreign markets are not into them, but no, it was a, it was a big movie here in town. It was in May of 06. So, 
I've written a couple other scripts. I, I took another one of his uh, Hyacinth's kids books and turned it into a movie script. And, you know, it's, it's good. I'm, it's about these kids trying to stop a casino boat from dumping all their sludge into the water. And, you know, these are all sort of, they're capers, you know, Hoot was a caper, you know? And uh, so I, you know, if I get a chance, I'd like to, I'm maybe not direct it, but I probably would, would produce it and sell the screenplay. Um, we're, we're shopping it around, you know, it's, this is a time of year where everybody's looking to do something, you know, what, what, what's our next project. So. Exactly. Yeah, a lot come, of product we, needs to be uh, come across now because they, they have to, they have to fill a lot of uh, empty space now, I would think. Yeah. Well, you know, we have the, yeah, we have these, you know, it used to, you know, our movie cost, <clears throat> cost $14 million to make was our budget. The, the prints and advertising, the, the marketing budget was $45 million. <gasps> So wow. we're at a $59 million break even on a movie like that today. I can make this move. I can make a movie today, you know, for 5 million, which is the number that everybody's looking at. If you can make a movie for 5 million, you can, you know, you can make, make money on it. You know, our, our movie was so expensive because uh, obviously you had 3000 prints that had to be struck. You had all this advertising. We had the kids, you know, Jimmy played on the today show and promote, did one of the songs from the movie. I mean, we had a big mar <clears throat> marketing push for the movie. But it's so much easier now, especially with Netflix and, and, and Amazon Prime. And, 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 and I mean, there's there's a lot more outlets for, for material, for content. You know, if you have good story and good characters, you probably can get them out there. But, uh, um, you know, their budgets aren't, you know, aren't 15 million dollars. Right. So can I if I could take you back to uh, okay. one of the interesting things that you brought up before was when you first got on uh, stage and you, you showed videos or you showed something. Tell me about the transition from that and how you built material, because that's always the most interesting thing, how long it took and, and where did you get the material from? Well, you would write things down every day. I mean, and, and a lot of times we used to go down, the comics would go down to uh, Cantor's right. after a show at the comedy store. And we'd sit around and we'd go, hey, Tom, you know that joke you do about so-and-so? You know, you could add this. And, you know, sometimes we'd help each other with material. Um, I had my little, these were like, I had a 16 millimeter projector. I'd set it up in the back of the room and show these. They were like, well, I, for lack of anything, like newsreels, funny newsreels. And uh, then I started doing, you know, other things. I did a... Uh, I did a, a couple of them uh, about the Democrat. I did one about the Democratic Convention. I did one where behind the scenes at the Tonight Show that I did with Dave on the Tonight Show. Wow! But the way you start with material, uh, you know, it's you, you have to do things that you think are funny. You know, I I, I met a guy, Larry Jacobson, who's a brilliant comedy writer. He wrote for Dave for about ten years and Jay for about twenty years. And Larry was selling shoes at Bullock's and he said, Hey, would, you know, I'm an aspiring comedian and writer. Would you look at some of my material? And I said, yeah, sure. I'll, and, and Larry and I collaborated on a lot. I mean, he, he wrote in the early stages, some of my big jokes, you know, they got huge laughs because Larry, and he's still a great comedy writer. He uh, calls me all the time. You know, he he's, you know, he's in his sixties and he's wondering where his next job is as we all are. But uh, I think it helps when you get with somebody who, who is funny to bounce off of, you know, I think a collaborative writing is easier than writing alone in a room. My friend Carl writes two books a year. I don't know how he does it. He puts on his, 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 you know, the headphone, the shotgun headphones and just writes. And I, I don't have that discipline. So, you know, I like to, uh, I, and I like to write on stage, you know, I'll be on stage and just come up with two or three new things right there. And then, and you go, that goes in the act. I remember what was a, a great joke the uh, about where where you where you meet women online, and I you know I'm all, I sometimes I ask where'd you you know where'd you meet your wife? Well, I met her on OK Cupid, and and uh, this guy says I met my wife on Amazon, and it, it got made me laugh. And I registered. and I said, and you know the best thing is they have a wonderful return policy. So it you know it just was a joke that came out of the conversation, and it's been in my act and been killing ever since. <laughs> You know, you were an L, uh, pretty much like you said, you, you were an L.A. Uh, comedian where a lot of the guys in the uh, 70s and the 80s, they came out of New York. They came out of Boston. Jay came out of Boston. All those guys came out of San Francisco, Robin and Bobby and uh, Dana. 
So how was that like being well, an L.A. guy? Well, you know, I started in L.A. And then when I moved to New York to write for Letterman, uh, I was living on the Upper East Side. I hung out at the comic strip. I used to go to the improv and do sets. I'd go to catch every once in a while. Didn't get on at catch a lot because, uh, you know, they already had a sort of an established you know, group of, of Larry David and all those guys that were there. But I worked at the comic strip anytime I wanted. And then, you know, at, at, into the 80s, I, I used to go up to Cobbs in, in San Francisco and I worked at a lot of those San Francisco clubs. I mean, then, then like early 80s, you know, the comedy club scene opened up all over. You know, Bud was opening improvs, comics, you know, there was Charlie Goodnights in Raleigh, there was, you know, Dallas. Or, so, you know, that was the best thing for any comedian was to get out of L.A., and work audiences, you know, around the country, because if you did a joke about the hookers on Sunset Boulevard, well, that didn't work in, you know, Des Moines, you know, you had to come up with material that people got. And I, I always, as a comic, I never worked dirty, but I always like to be able to look at the audience and sort of tailor my set to what they, you know, if I was opening for Loretta Lynn or a country star, you know, they sometimes, those audience weren't as hip as, you know, as, as if you're opening for, you know, if you're opening for, I don't, we, we, you know, uh, pick, pick an act, but, you know, I worked with, a lot of times I worked with Seinfeld and around the country and we were a bunch of us, Paula Poundstone, we were all doing shows together. I mean, so I worked with Kennison. I was on a bill with Kennison in, uh, in St. Louis at our theater in the round. It was Dr. Demento, me and Sam Kennison, wow. I mean, the buyer. The buyer wanted to open with Sam, then me, and then Demento. And I said, well, you know, have you seen Sam? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, he says, no. I said, no, I, I, I think I'd go first. I'd be better putting me on first. He goes, well, you got more credits than Sam. Sam was just getting hot with Saturday Night Live. And, and I said, no, that's, it's not about credits. <laughs> Let me go first. So I go on, and I have my half-hour show. And then Sam comes on, and he kills him. He does his half-hour. And then Dr. Demento goes on and got nothing. He's oh. like he plays records he he basically you know it was like crickets and they were in <laughs> sam's head you suck do something <laughs> and, and the, we were doing four shows and the buyer comes back and he goes oh uh hey guys can we talk oh demento says can we talk about the show order a little bit and i said what's the matter i missed the headline i having trouble closing the show and he's yes i am <laughs> he went first then me then sam that's how the show so the show got adjusted for what was best for the show. I mean, when you're doing these shows, it's not, I, I never look at it about credits. In the old days, comics all wanted to be the headliner. They want to be like, I want to, I'll go on last. I'll go on last. Today, all of us want to get home and go to bed. And go oh, first. <laughs> but that's funny. That's I have no funny. problem going first. I actually like warming up. I like, I, you know, because I, I did warm ups on the morning Letterman show. I did warm ups on my show. I mean, I like kind of warming the crowd up a little bit. You know, it's, it, you know, the, the thing, Bruce, I think that it's important to have in your toolkit is a variety of tools. You know, yeah. if you're just one thing, you limit your, your, your employability. I mean, I can go out and do, uh, you know, a corporate show. I, 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 I lecture and talk about humor and how important it is in business and life and relationships you know, and then I can go, I went out and I produced the Windows 2000 launch for Microsoft back in 2000. And it was a $6 million launch event. And I got hired by the people that do the Grammys who were busy doing the Grammys. And they said, well, you know, computers, you want, you want to do it. I so I, I wrote it, went up there. We had this huge, we had, uh, I got, uh, uh, what's his name from Picard. I got, uh, you know, the Star Trek guy. I can't think of his name now. Uh, you know, the lead guy. What's the old, he's bald guy. He I wasn't a big guy. star. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. yeah, he's been around. He's a British actor, been around forever. Anyway, he's the host. We had Carlos Santana, you uh. know, as the musical attraction. And Bill Gates was the host. And Bill uh, came out and, you know, he was asking, he said, can I have a couple of funny jokes when I come out? And so, yeah, sure. You know, because he did this with Jay once and Jay had some jokes. So we wrote a few jokes for him. And he came out and uh, he didn't get some of the jokes. I, we built this enormous computer that opened up and played this movie on it. And, and, I, and I said, do you like the giant computer they made for me? You should see the size of my desk. <laughs> and he, he was, like, oh, you know, and he screwed the joke up. He, he, screwed, he screwed the joke up because it's really in disguise a dick joke. But right, he went, right, right. oh, do you like the giant computer they made for me? It's perfect for my desk. No joke there, nothing. You know, it's just like, so then, then, then we had this, uh, oh, the giant computer. He said, you wouldn't believe what trouble it was getting it in the overhead bin on the flight down here. And he looks, he stared at me like blankly. And I go, oh. 
<laughs> you remember when you fly commercially, how you put your luggage up above? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. That's funny. That's good. And I go, oh, yeah, you're losing touch. You're losing touch with the working <laughs> class. So he, for whatever reason, uh, and it, because I basically handled him like I would handle anybody with some sarcasm and some humor, he hired me when he retired from Microsoft as the ch chairman to become the chief architect. He hired me to do a five-minute video about his life to show wherever he went to talk. So we, we got pitched and they had a, you know, a nice size budget to do it. We, we had to pitch a bunch of ideas. We eventually pitched a day in his life. And, you know, we had him going to Starbucks. We had him taking, taking the sweaters to the, he takes, he takes like four of the same sweaters to the dry cleaner and he's picking up this four of the same sweaters and he's wearing the sweater, the dry cleaner's wearing the sweater and he goes, <laughs> I'm missing a sweater. <laughs> he, he, you know, he, and he, he, he goes, why is that funny? I go, well, you know, cause, cause that you're so clueless. You don't realize you're, the guy has a sweater on, but I would explain these jokes to him and he go, he's at a coffee shop and he buys DOS for dummies off the discount shelf for 10 cents. And he goes, I don't get that. Why? I, you know, I go, Hey, Microsoft, you guys have made your fortune off of the DOS shell. That was what got Microsoft started. And I said, if it doesn't get a laugh, I'll mow your yard. Why are you going to mow my yard? I go, because that's how confident I am that this will get a laugh. We take it to Vegas for the Comdex, which is a big computer show in Vegas. We show it at the MGM, 10,000 people. And when the camera landed on that book, they started laughing and they didn't stop laughing. You couldn't even hear the dialogue. It was wow. such a huge bit. And he used it for years. And, wow. you know, for me, it was just, it was sort of a cool thing to do. And, uh, and years, about, I don't know, maybe... I don't know. A few months later, I got a call from the people at Frazier and they said, Hey, can we get, is there any way you could get Gates to come on Frazier? You know, the show takes place in Seattle. And I said, yeah, well, have you asked him before? And they go, yo, you've asked him many times. He doesn't want to, he hasn't wanted to do it. I said, well, I don't know. I, you know, I can run it up the flagpole, see what happens. He, uh, the next two days later, I get a call from his handler, the guy I dealt with. He goes, Hey, we've got this new Vista product. Do you think there's any way we could get on Frasier to talk about it. Oh, like, for God's oh, sake. I oh, wow. I don't know. They don't do that kind of thing, but let me see what I can do. And it just came together. Bill came down. He pl he came in the radio station on Frasier, talked to him. It was just a great, you know, it was like a great experience. And and Bill, was he was kind of a geek. I took him around and showed him the Paramount lot, took him in the Star Trek sets. And, wow. you know, he just had a great time. And then I've never been hired again. And I asked Ooh. the guy, so how come I never get hired? He goes, oh, they don't like, if you have too much, authority or power over you know if you, they, they don't bring you back there's no repeat business and it's, it's you know in our in in comedy it's all about repeat business sure. if you open if you open for somebody you want to you know you want to tour with them or you want to you know if you're at a comedy club and you fill it up you want to come back in you know six months and do it again so i don't know it, it's I've, I've digressed from your question but well uh, that's that's great i mean you you dealt with one of the most uh, powerful people uh, in the world, certainly at that time. And I'm curious to see how your relationship was with Bud and, and, uh, and how, how you, cause th there's that bridge between not working at the improv and working and also not working uh, yet at the comedy store and getting to work. I'd love to hear about that. Well, you know, the comedy store and the improv Mitzi, God bless her soul. And Bud, you know, they, they were front runners. If you were on TV and you were doing famous and you meant something, you know, to the audience that they, hey, we saw, us, you know, Robin could walk in any store he wanted to. Byron was hot at the time. Byron Allen was on Real People, you know, Skip Stevenson, you know, Tommy, you know, most of us could work either club. And uh, I had a great relationship with Bud. I played poker with him probably for 10 years. It was Bud Robinson, my manager yeah. at the time, Bud Friedman, yeah. Tom Dreesen, yeah. Rich Hall, yeah. Jay Sandrich, one of the great TV directors, uh, John Boab, another great TV director, Eugene Leibowitz. You know, there was about 10 of us and we rotated through. We played at Bud's house. We, you know, wherever we played, the guy had to host the, the, the meal. So, you know, we, we constantly, you know, we pull out of the pot, but we constantly would get on Bud's case because this we didn't feel, feel like this meal was worth $80. <laughs> you know, we, you skimped on it, but, but Alex, I think Alex has been a great influence on Bud. Oh, yeah. you know, I've known, I knew Bud before Alex. I've known Bud since, I guess I met him in New York and in, in, uh, I probably met him in 77, 78. And, and then I used to go, I think silver was running the New York improv when I'd pop in there every once in a while. Um, but no, Bud's a great guy. He's, you know, and, and his daughters are Beth and, 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 and Zoe are great kids. And 
I think Beth's had one of them worked for Comedy Central for a long time. Zo- Zoe's uh, been on the show. I had a great show with Zoe. Oh yeah, Zoe. Zoe. They're great kids. I mean, and they're you know they you know how do you not learn it? And I don't. What's what's Dax doing? I don't see. I haven't heard from Dax. Was uh, Alex's son? I don't know if he went into show business. Ross went into show business. That's the other son. Ross was producing stuff, you know. But uh, yeah, no, I I, I enjoyed. I, I miss all those guys. I mean, Bud's you know getting up there in years. I think he's you know had a. You know, he still he he used to come through here and do the he had a cruise that he would do. He'd come through here, and uh, whenever he came through at the Hard Rock, we'd go down and see. I went to see Brian Curry with him. I saw a few comics when he was in town. We'd all go hang out. Wow, yeah, I think he's lost a little bit of his health right now, and uh... yeah, I think he's in a wheelchair now and not not mobile. And but uh, you know, God bless him. He's a great guy, and he you know he was like you say. You could stand in the hall if you had a series. If you didn't have a series, if you're walking along, get out of the hallway. You can't stand in the hallway, you know. But you know that's what I knew I'd made it when I could stand in the hall without blood or you know. But no, he, you know, he he had a good eye for talent, and if he if there, if he liked you, you know, he'd give you good spots, you know. And there were there were guys. I mean, you know, there was the improv. It was different than the store in the sense that the improv was a better hangout because they had a restaurant out front and they had a bar and you know. The comedy store I always found to be darker, you know, to go up there, you know, it, it wasn't the same kind of hang uh, that the improv was, exactly. but and they, there was a time when they were competing. And then, they, then when, when, when the, when the improv burned down, you know, then it was really, you know, it was tough for Bud and we had, a, we had a little room in the front, you know, but that was during the strike, which, you know, I'm sure you've talked about the strike. I was, I was there, I was real relatively new only only been working maybe a year a year as a comic and uh you know i i didn't you know i supported this the picket line but i didn't feel like i needed to be paid yet i was still pretty green but there were guys in the main room with 500 seats every night selling it out and they weren't getting paid so that's what it sort of was the the genesis like well she's making a ton of money why can't we make some money yeah everything changed a little bit after that many ways good and some of the ways bad a lot of the guys would say that business started taking over and that kind of changed things a little bit. She helped her, her people. You know, if, if you were doing a showcase of Jim McCauley, the tonight show booker was coming in to see somebody, she put Argus on in front of him so that Argus would be seen. She put on her Mike mind or whoever she put on people who she wanted that booker to see, be aware of. And Bud sort of did the same. I, I remember I would walk in the room once in a while and, and the improv and they'd have these big, industry showcases and you know they're traditionally a not a great crowd you know right. so it's you know people that you know uh, we, we've seen that before uh i remember seeing jim carrey i had i had met jim carrey up in 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 uh, vancouver uh, i'd done a couple of tv shows with him up there and he came down and he was set to be on the tonight show he set to, he was going to do his set at the improv a couple of days ahead of time and it was an industry showcase everybody's going to hear to see jim carrey and he i guess he wasn't used to not getting that kind of reaction that he always gets. And that crowd was, you know, sit on their hands, not too enthusiastic, not great laughers. And Jim kind of, you know, had a little meltdown there and went back to Canada. Wow. And then he came back, you know, he came back again, you know, and of course, you know, we, we, uh, we were together and Peggy Sue got married with Harry Basil, another comedian. And, you know, we all, you know, for us, we were all just, you know, we're working with Coppola and we were spending every weekend at his house. And, you know, it was just such a great experience. And, uh, uh, but Jim, you know, Jim now, you know, then Jim stopped doing his standing ovation act and, and he, I'm sure it's in his book. He, he was a standing ovation every night could do anything. And then he decided he didn't like it. And he decided to create all these crazy characters, you know, fireman Bob and all these guys. And he just, just can that act and started doing new stuff. And Mitzi gave him, you know, all the leeway to do whatever he wanted and to be creative and be different. And, uh, you know, then he came up and got on living color after that. And then that was the explosion of his career. Yeah. I remember picking him out and saying uh, when he, when he first did evening at the improv, I said, this guy is good. He is, he's going to make it. And boy, yeah, he had he had these impressions that were sort of caricatures. Oh, he would do Sammy, things. remember he did sure. Sammy Davis Jr. Yeah, oh. Sammy, oh yeah, yeah. Well, he's got a rubber face, so he could get away with anything. Oh. Well, you know the improv, the improv was a great training ground. I remember Bud put me on after Billy Crystal for like two weeks in a row. I remember. I was there. Up, I remember. Billy, 
Yeah, Billy was doing like 45 minutes and just killing it. And when Billy got done, he'd say goodnight. And the audience was like, okay, we've seen enough. And they, you know, they they start piling out and the MC would just bring you right up. He didn't, you know, like, oh, there's the next guy. And you'd, you'd have to swim upstream through, you know, 200 people leaving to get up and go on. But it was a great, you know, for me, it was just a great toughening ground where, you know, ah, go on and go. Yeah, nothing more to see here. And you had to just deal with it. And, you know, and that's part of comedy and that's, I tell people that all the comedy is all about being in the moment. You know, if somebody drops a tray of drinks and you don't address it, then they think you're not even there. You're just doing this routine act. So you have to kind of address, you know, whatever the elephant in the room is. And that's, that's when Billy went on to do Saturday night. Uh, yep, yep, he worked yep, out yep. his characters at the improv th those weeks. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I mean, there were a lot of guys. I mean, that's what those rooms were for, you know, you couldn't go out, you know, if you were a headlining on the road, you couldn't go out and experiment, you know, for 20 minutes at the improv, you know, people are coming. It's the improv. It's comedy. They're coming no matter what, you know, and, and, and it gave a lot of guys the opportunity to, uh, to you know, to, to expand and, and, and try things and be different. You know, I think, uh, I think both Mitzi and Bud, you know, are, should be commended because they really, if they liked you and they gave you that leeway, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was a beautiful, you know, place to work and a, a great springboard. So, my last question for you, and this has been great. I mean, I'm so impressed with how accomplished you are and been and uh, all that you've done. I really didn't have any idea. It's kind of one of the great reasons why I do this show is for people to talk about their careers. Who were your buds? Who are the guys that you consider? I know you talked about the card playing guys, and but who are your friends? Oh, my friends. Well, you know, the, the biggest the biggest break I got in my career was Dave Letterman. Was really when he took me to New York to work with him and put me on the Tonight Show with him and all that. I mean, he was like a you know a a, a in a way, and we we were my my dad's from Indiana, Dave's from Indiana. There was an Indiana connection, and we both lived uptown, so I would ride home with him after work. And so Dave was a guy who I really was very fond of in those days and who was really instrumental in me mo moving up the food chain. Uh, Jay Leno and I were good buddies back then. We rode motorcycles together, me, me and uh, him and Arsenio and Rick Overton. A bunch of us used to ride motorcycles up to the rock store and hang out. Um, as far as uh, the guys, my, my, my dear friend was Eugene Leibowitz, who's a writer, who was a writer on my show, and Larry Jacobson, who was, you know, is still my friend. I mean, both of them are still my friend and they're great guys. And, you know, Howard, Howard Allen is a buddy, you know, I mean, the guys I played golf with, you know, Mac and Jamie were buddies. I mean, I, I, there, it was a thing in comedy. We would go on the road and you'd have an opener, a middle and a headliner. And usually the middle and the headliner were from LA. And so you spend a week or two in a condo eating dinner and hanging with these guys and you just become fast friends. Now, you know, in these days we don't see each other and we, you know, we don't, we don't get to hang out as much as we used to because you're everybody's off doing their own thing. But, uh, you know, there were a lot of guys that, uh, you know, that I learned from, I, you know, I, th I think if you're a comic starting out, go and watch, watch as many people. I tell my son all the time, go and watch other comedians, see what works for them, see what they're doing, see how they're addressing, you know, the, the, the issues. I mean, it's going to be interesting coming back from COVID because I, you know, I have some jokes about COVID and stuff like that, but, um, you know, will people really want to hear it or will people just want to say, let's put it behind us, you know, COVID's old and, you know, let's get, just go back to being funny. Um, but, you know, I used to have a great, uh, uh, opener that had referenced Donald Trump and, you know, he, he'll be long gone and, and the joke, so the, the joke will be dead. And it was like one of those jokes that I used for years, uh, uh, it was how Trump, I, I would say it's, it's great to be here tonight. It's a beautiful crowd. It's, according to Trump's estimates, we've got over 50,000 people here tonight <laughs> and it would get a big laugh. And, it, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I won't have that joke anymore. I won't, <laughs> but you know, we'll find somebody else who's exaggerating and put it on them. I think I, I think it started with somebody else originally. I think it started with Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan when he misjudged the million man much, but, uh, you know, so, so. Uh, you know, writing is, is, uh, I, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to get back out there. I mean, I, I, I don't know, you know, people are not going to want to have people laughing and coughing on them for another, I don't know, another six months till they forget about this pandemic and nobody, and nobody, you know, uh, everybody's immune. Then maybe we will we'll be back to normal. But for me, luckily I do a lot of stuff on my computer. I, you know, I produce stuff for other people and, uh, and do corporate stuff. So, you know, I, I'm not completely out of work and, 
the best thing about show business is if you're an actor or director or writer, they know we're not good at saving our money. So they put it away for us. And so when you turn 65, you get your pensions. Oh. So I, have, I have a SAG pension, an after pension, a WGA pension, a DGA pension. So those, you know, fortunately, they afford me the ability to live, you know, and, you know, not have to worry about working. Very nice. I've thought quite a bit about that. And you help me uh, figure that out here in the very last seconds of the show. Will, <laughs> you've been great. And I really appreciate you spending this time with me. Uh, I've learned a lot from you and about you. And you, you're filling in the, the squares and the bricks there about what went on in the 80s and the 70s and all about comedy. And uh, I want to thank you for being on the show. Oh, well, it was great fun to be on. I mean, I love to talk about the old days. I mean, you know, but you always got to think about the days ahead and what's going to do next. I sent you some pictures from, you know, when I was, I was at Center Square uh, on Hollywood Squares and I my, uh, I, I belong, I belong, I belong to a club over here and they always mock me. Oh, here comes the Center Square. And I go, <laughs> hey, anybody else in this club a Center Square? So <laughs> shut up. Yeah. But, you know, you, you know, we all, you know, everybody has a chance, everybody, you know, everybody's got you know, I, I've done a lot of in, interviews and stuff, and there's, there's always something interesting to find in everybody else. You, sometimes you just got to peel away at the layers. Well, you know, we both are here in South Florida, and I'm a fan, and, uh, you know, I, I know we'll keep in touch, and anytime, you know, you're performing and your son... Uh, I you know, I know a million jokes and I love to laugh and I love, you know, I'm on, I'm a, a rear Commodore at my yacht club, so I have a captive audience. So they oh, have to laugh wow. At me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, we'll have to get all, we'll have to get everybody together. We'll get Brucey Please. together. And, uh, oh, yeah. That would be a lot of fun. I'd love it. Thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. 80s golden age of comedy. Will Schreiner, thanks. And we'll see you again, everybody, for another 80s golden age of comedy. Bye-bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.